Professor Nelson here from Conestoga College School of Workforce Development. I'd like to continue uh, looking at quality tools that are applied to the additive manufacturing technology. It's something that many of you may be exposed to in a, in a manufacturing environment. Uh, there's a good chance that many of you are going to be exposed to this technology. So I think it's useful to understand what kind of quality tools apply to this. So in this particular video, there's a gentleman who has been in this industry for a long, long time. He's just a private individual. He has developed himself the quality inspection techniques that are needed for additive manufacturing in his own workshop. So let's have a look. I'm not going to show the whole video. I'm going to start and stop. I'd, it doesn't matter what his results are. We don't really care for the purposes of this video. More, my point is just to show you the techniques that he's using. All right, have a, let's have a look. But today, resin printers. These things have been getting incredibly cheap and really good lately. They're not quite as convenient or safe to use as filament printers. And the other thing that usually comes up is, isn't the resin like super brittle and weak? So that's what we're going to find out today. Uh, you We'll be doing four tests on each material. A rigidity test, a bend strength test, an impact test, and a pull test. Some of these tests are inspired by the actual engineering standards, like this one, uh, but since I don't have the means to do any of them 100% to spec, I'm instead focusing on getting meaningful test results in some more custom setups to give you a realistic idea of how well these materials would perform in a real world application. So let's get started with the first one, the bend test, these guys. Uh, for this one, I've got these testing sticks that come down to a 10 by 10 millimeter cross section with some beveled edges. It goes into a rigid holder, where's that thing? There it is, on one side, and on the other end, exactly 100 millimeters out, it's got this loop that um, I can hook my trusty luggage scale into, and that is going to show me at what weight or how much force I need to apply to finally snap our specimen here. So let's start with the PLA and the PTG. Since filament prints have actual layers, I've got two parts each. One printed standing up, so that we're testing layer adhesion, uh, the other printed laying flat to test material strength. So just to very quickly explain what he's talking about here. He's printed these test pieces both ways, lying down flat like this and standing up on their end like this. And he's doing that to test the effect of the layers. Ultimately, we're looking at the adhesion of the layers. So as you may know, or you should know by now, for all these 3D printed parts, everything is printed in layers. So a layer on top of a layer on top of a layer on top of a layer. So the parts that are lying down are a bunch of very long layers adhere to each other, where the parts that are printed up are a bunch of thin layers printed on top of each other. So if you imagine one of these parts that are standing up, if you tried to break it in half like that, you're splitting it across a layer. And that might be a whole lot easier than the pieces that are long layers like this, and you're trying to break it in half. So he's printed the test pieces in both orientations. And again, this is a very different situation than with traditional machining, where you don't even machine the test pieces like this on the same machine or in the same way that you're machining your part. Uh, but, but it's the nature of additive manufacturing that you're looking at the material properties that are a result of the printing, not the material properties that are the result of the raw material manufacturing. For layer adhesion, the PLA holds just under 8 kilograms, the PTG 5.9. Testing the material strength itself with the part printed flat, we saw 16.6 kilograms for PLA and a did not fail for PTG. The Prusa Tough Resin breaks at 9.7 kilograms, the Elegoo at 10.5, so both resins are stronger than the filament prints when tested for layer adhesion, but are weaker with the filament prints aligned with the direction of the layers. Let's check out how rigid these materials are. 
a softer material will usually perform better in the strength tests and in the real world as well because it can distribute load over a wider cross section by slightly stretching and conforming without breaking. So for the tests I printed these springs for each material and I'm hanging a one kilogram spool or roughly one kilogram spool of filament uh, from them to see how far they stretch. These springs are not linear um, but it, that is intentionally designed that way so that I could get results for anything from a carbon fiber filled PTG to a super elastic TPU with that same model. So, so you notice here this is Part of what I want to point out, he needs a one kilogram weight and happens to know that a brand new reel of filament weighs one kilogram. And he's custom designed a spring that he prints in plastic. So very creative. And he's got himself a board and a wall. He hangs them up on the board and then runs his test. And he's got a little tape measure uh, or even just a printed tape measure stuck to the board and he can measure the deflection just using this very very simple setup. For PLA we get a stretch of 14 millimeters, for PTG it's 18 millimeters, Elegoo resin ends up at 19 and the Prusa Tough at 26. I think I have an explanation for these results but we'll get to that in the end. For now let's just keep in mind that PLA is actually the most rigid material out of these. Elegoo resin and PTG are basically identical and Prusa resin is much softer. Okay, and again, it doesn't really matter what the results, well, 14 millimeters, 16 millimeters, 18 millimeters. It's not a standard test, and that's not the point. It's standard for him. He has consistently used this same test, that same spring, this same weight, the same configuration, time and time and time again. And so he's created a baseline, and he knows what's good, and he knows what's bad. And any new part that he tests, months from now or years from now, he can do exactly the same way, test it the same, and compare the results to his baseline. So he can certainly make judgments about the quality material, even though he's using a not a standard industry test. Next, what I call the pull test. These are elongated rings, um, once printed upright, at least for the filaments, and once laying flat. Uh, and the flat ones are actually only half as thick uh, because otherwise, well, I wouldn't be able to break them. I figured that out the hard way. Let's get started with PLA again. The first thicker layer adhesion test broke at 16.5 kilograms, the thinner layer strength test at 20.75 kilograms, which, if it were the same thickness, would be 41.5 kilograms. That's pretty good for such a small piece of material. But it's easily bested by PTG, which achieves 24.5 kilograms printed standing up and an impressive equivalent of 70.8 kilograms when printed flat. We can again see that uh, the PTG prints stretch and deform a lot before breaking, which gives them much of their strength. Moving on to the resins. Uh... Okay, so in destructive testing, uh, he's pointing out even with a standard test, it's not just about the numbers, it's about the actual fracture mechanism of the material. So once you've done the destructive test, it's very, very common. You would go back and look at the part and you see how it's failed. And the failure mode, the way it's come apart, the way it's deformed or the way it's broken, tells you a lot about the quality of the material. So again, it's not critically important that he's done a formal ISO standard uh, testing mechanism is that he is following a given like he's following a formal procedure he's got a well controlled test he does the same sort of test over and over again so he's comparing apples to apples and and it's effective and serves the need all right stop hammer time this last test i think is the most fun one we get stuff flying around everywhere Every single sample will break in here and I get to swing a hammer. This is actually the test that is the closest to the proper way of doing it. And if you want to look up the exact specs, it's the Izot Impact Strength Test. Use a sample that is again 10 by 10 millimeters, but it has a notch in the center that makes it break in that one exact spot. Then we hit it with a swinging weight and measure how far it swings back up after it has destroyed the sample. 
right there. I capture this on camera and do that uh, evaluation digitally. You can see the scale right here, obviously, if it swings up all the way again to up there, our sample has absorbed absolutely no energy from the hammer at all while breaking. If it gets stopped right here, it has absorbed everything. So depending on how far it swings back up, we can measure how tough the material is and that's going to impact how well it handles blows and impacts. Yeah. Uh, three tests for filament prints. Again, one testing layer adhesion printed like that, then one tested with the notch printed up top so we get interrupted layers, and one printed with the notch on the side to get continuous layers. Predictably, the sample printed to test layer adhesion was the weakest at just 90 millijoules absorbed. Then the flat sample with the interrupted layers at 350 millijoules and the sideways part with a continuous shell at 390 millijoules. PTG performed slightly better at 110, 350 and 480 millijoules. Here's a gentleman with a need to assess the quality of his printed materials. It's not about dimensional characteristics, it's about strength characteristics. So he's been forced to and responded by building his own test bases or test benches and has very effectively been able to test the quality of his materials. And I think you may find that that is true for other Industry 4.0 technologies where the company or the producer recognizes that the risk has changed and has to respond with different quality measures and quality tools. I thought I'd take a minute and demonstrate. Uh, I also do my own 3D printing and so you'll find many people who do printing also to print out test pieces. So these are specifically designed models that help test the quality of the printing and the quality of the printer. Um, so this is known as an overhang test. You have printed intentionally these pieces that are hanging off in space and you can't really see the detail. They're marked in five degree increments and you can see the quality of the overhang material gets worse and worse the increasing slope. So, my, so that tells me that my printer is quite capable of printing 50 or 55 percent um, slope and anything beyond that as an, as an overhang I wouldn't rely on. Same thing here, these uh, testing different spans coming to different points, different circles, different lines, so it shows the resolution of my printer, the XY axis alignment, the proportions, the accuracy, the stringiness, the temperature, all kinds of things. And so typically what you'll do is print out um, this same test model for whenever you maybe do some maintenance on your printer or whenever you change materials. So again, these aren't standard, you're not going to find this in an ISO test, but it doesn't matter. This is what the technology needs, these are the quality checks you need to do, so you build an appropriate test and as long as it satisfies your needs for quality inspection, it's perfectly acceptable to use. With each new technology comes new risk. And the risk is really what I think we're trying to address with quality, quality tools, inspection tools. So if the risk changes, the tool has to change, the quality inspection has to change. So when I release the assignment that's uh, associated with this module, that's what I'm going to be asking you to do. Take a look at an industry 4.0 technology of your choice and examine the risk that are inherent in that new technology and use that to inform your view and your presentation on the use of traditional quality and the use of new quality inspection tool techniques or tools related to that industry. Okay, and finally I want to show um, a little more industrial printing. I've been showing you or demonstrating plastic or PLA or resin printing so far, which are very, very useful, but many people don't see 3D printing as being serious until you can print in metal. So I found a very good demonstration by a company that makes uh, 3D print machines, 3D printers, 
and they're demonstrating here the 3D metal printing process. So let's have a look. Hey everyone, I'm here to talk today about the MarkForge Metal X process. It's a simple, safe, and cost-effective method to go from design to functional metal part. There are three steps in this process, printing, washing, and then sintering. First, let's start with CAD. You design your part, then export to STL and upload into Iger. It automatically configures your part based on the material and printer you've selected. When your part slices for metal 3D printing, it gets scaled up to account for shrink and deformation in the downstream processes. It then slices your part into discrete layers, identifies overhang features, and builds supports and a raft underneath your part. As we go through printing, washing, and sintering, Iger will monitor the part's progress along the way. Let's start this print and go to the Metal X. Before starting a print, the machine automatically maps and levels the bed to ensure the first layer goes down well. Your print is built of two materials stored in this heated chamber above. One of ceramic release material and one of the metal to be printed. This filament material is metal powder safely suspended within a two-part plastic binder. It gets heated and extruded onto the build plate where the part is created layer by layer. The release material gets extruded as an interface between the part and its supports so that once your part comes out of the furnace, it's easy to remove. Unlike other metal 3D printing systems, this process does not require loose metal powder, resulting in a safer and more cost-efficient workflow. 17-4 stainless steel is loaded now. However, with a quick changeover, the system is capable of printing in stainless steels, tool steels, coppers, inconel, along with several other materials currently in development. Once your part is finished printing, you'll get a notification. At this point, you can go to the printer, remove the part from the build tray, and clear the bed. Now we have what's called a green part. It doesn't really look or feel like metal. However, a large part of it is comprised of metal powder. Next step, we'll be putting it into wash one for the debind process. The wash one removes the first stage of the binding material. A green part is taken from the printer and placed into the wash basket, which is then lowered into the solvent. Wash times will vary, ranging from a few hours to a few days, depending on the thickest region of your part. After that, it's now called a brown part and is ready for sintering. Let's go over to the furnaces. This is Sinter 2, a furnace designed for mid-volume production runs and larger printed parts. Sintering transforms a print from a lightly bound collection of metal powder to a fully finished metal part. First, the temperature ramps slowly to burn away the trace amounts of remaining binding material. Then, temperature ramps closer to the melting point of the material, allowing metal particles to start to fuse together to create a strong metal part. Mark, once a run is complete, the setter tray full of finished metal pieces can be removed from the furnace. Once removed from the raft, these parts are ready for use. In the furnace, the layer of printed release material between supports and the raft and your printed part remains powderized. This allows the structure to be tacked to the raft to better control shrink and accuracy throughout the process, but also an easy release after sintering. At this stage, your part is fully sintered and ready to be used. It can be post-machined, polished, or otherwise processed as necessary for the final application, but in many uses, the accuracy and strength are good enough as is. It's ready for install. Check out markforge.com for more information about our simple, safe, and cost-effective method of metal additive manufacturing. So, it's still a very simple process. I'm still using this sort of fused deposition modeling, FDM, where the material is coming off of a filament reel, but now it's a combination of plastic and metal. My printer is not capable of printing metal, but I do have a spool of wood filament. It's actually bamboo, uh, so very small particles of bamboo that are again embedded into a plastic carrier. It comes out and I'm kind of looking uh, like a nice bamboo color and in fact you can sand it. Which is this sort of combined technology or this um, hybrid printing material is quite fascinating. All right, so the question that I asked at the beginning of this video series, are traditional quality tools still used for Industry 4.0 technologies, and in this specific case, 3D printing? And the answer, as I've demonstrated here, is yes, but the type of quality tools has changed because the risk has changed. In traditional machining, the risk is poor raw material or 
incorrect metal removal. Whereas in 3D printing, the poor raw material is still a risk, so there is still some testing of the raw materials, but the much more likely failure mode, which is very catastrophic in a 3D printed part, is poor layer adhesion. And so we need destructive testing to validate and ensure that the layer adhesion in the printing process has gone uh, according to plan. All right, and so what I will explore in the next week's module and what we'll talk about is beyond the additive manufacturing, but looking at other Industry 4.0 technologies and let's take into consideration what those technologies are demanding of the quality tools. Are the traditional tools still applied or are new tools for assessing the quality of these new technologies required? Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in our last support session.